Okay. All right. So let's get started um, on what it, what you know planning and prioritizing and what that's all about. So here's the thing. Um, one of the one of the most challenging uh, tasks for for many of us, whether we have ADHD or not, is understanding the difference when something is urgent and something is important, and that helps us prioritize. Prioritizing is not just based on our ability to organize, although it's related. It's not just based on our ability to plan, um, although it's related. And of course, it's not just based on time management, although it's related. What we want to talk about actually is the difference between things that are urgent and important and how they kind of overlap. And I'm looking right now on my desktop, so I apologize everybody for that. But I, I printed out um, and I want to put it in the chat, something that I think will be very useful to you if I can find it. Hi, Gail from Boston. Great to have you. Um, so I can't find the thing that I want to show you. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, uh, it was hiding under something else. Okay, so I want to show you the Dr. Celine version of the urgent and important matrix, which is often called the Eisenhower matrix. And I'm going to put it in the quote in the, I, I don't know if I can share it with you. Let's see. Um, did that work? No, it did not. All right. It, you, you'll see it in my, um, in that downloadable I gave you, but we want to, and I don't know, um, Annie, if you're able to somehow share the matrix, I have it on a screenshot, but I can't seem to upload it into the comment. Wait, hold on. No, no, can't do it. Okay. All right. So now what is the difference between urgent and important? Let's start there. Okay. So what we're going to think about, and I know this is difficult without the actual chart in front of you, and I wish I could figure out how to upload. If anyone can help me figure out how to upload a screenshot so I can share it with you, I'd really appreciate it. So we want to think about a diagram like this, a square. And on different quadrants are different things. Along one axis is urgent, and along the other axis is important. So quadrant one where these where it meets like this quadrant one are the urgent and important tasks and this is the do it now crisis the crisis quadrant now the difference between urgent and important tasks is that urgent tasks cause us to react immediately and stop whatever else we're doing to attend to them there's a time pressure that's associated with urgency right show a graph on my video feed Ooh, whoa, that is high tech, Susan Richardson. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Annie. Okay, um, I do have a, 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 a my video feed. If I knew how to do that, I would, but I'm gonna email this to Annie because she will actually get it immediately. So hold on, just so you all have what I'm working from, okay? And I apologize for the bumps. Uh, it is our first time back in quite a while, so thank you for your patience. Okay, so let's go back to the definition. What is urgent and what is important, okay? Something that's urgent is something that needs to be done now. Things like crises, emergencies, deadlines, last-minute items, you're bleeding, you need a Band-Aid, it's urgent, okay? Okay. That's different from tasks that are important. Tasks that are important guide us toward our purpose and goals and reflect our life, our life values. They rely on planning, organization, and initiation. Um, when we are in the crisis mode, uh, what happens to us is we, we, we get depleted. And so um, quadrant one, which is the quadrant of crises, or what I call the do it now the quadrant, actually uh, um, stresses us out. It's what creates burnout. And it, we want to minimize the time spent here by using schedules and improving our organizational skills. And it's important to understand this. So this is a place in quadrant one where you want to um, be able to delegate, where you want to actually, where your planning and prioritizing skills really are tested. And you may need help 
identifying and clarifying priorities and brainstorm ways to chunk activities and schedule things. So that's all about quadrant one, the do it now quadrant. The, the second quadrant is, the quad, is quadrant two. So these are things that are important, but they're not urgent. And this has to do with goals and planning. It's what I call the quadrant of flow. And this is very important because in this quadrant, you are, you're, you're cooking along, right? You, um, you, you have, you, whatever you do in this quadrant helps us work toward goals or projects, keep balance in our lives, like a yearly physical or booking a haircut. Time in this quadrant is like riding a bike. You're staying on top of important things. You're making progress. You're feeling calmer because we're dealing with most issues before they arise because we, ha we're ha we have created some sort of schedule, we've mapped out a plan for ourselves, we're not working under pressure. Okay, quadrant, two, quadrant three is the, it, when it's not important but it's urgent. These are things like interruptions or certain calls, some meetings, some kind of internal pressure to check things off a list. This is the quadrant of interruptions. These activities interrupt and steer us away from our important tasks. Time in quadrant three feels like we're not getting anywhere, okay? Uh, we're stuck, we're frustrated, and we're stressed out. This is the quadrant of what I call productive procrastination. You're doing other things that need to get done, but you're still avoiding that big thing that you don't really want to do because you don't like doing it. In this quadrant, we want to minimize the time that we spend here by reviewing a task list, focusing on high important tasks first, and learning to say no to other people's interruptions. And we, I'd like to talk with you about how you do that a bit later. And finally, quadrant four, and this is a, a quadrant that is really troublesome for a lot of people with ADHD. It's the quadrant where things aren't important and they're not urgent. So this is a quadrant of distractions. We might have, you know, so sur surfing the web, vi video, uh, gaming, television, trivial stuff, including stress cleaning or endless lists. These are activities that distract us from the tasks at hand. Anything we do to waste time and avoid necessary work. Quadrant four is about avoidance procrastination, tardiness, incomplete work, negative self-talk and stress. We want to increase our awareness of things that distract us and set limits with these activities. And in the link that I gave you to the handout on my website, the first page has this qu the quadrants and what they are. And the second page is a bonus activity for you to use to try to help you understand where you operate in these quadrants. So I'd like to take a minute now and, and really talk to people about um, where they are. <laughs> Cassandra, you're stress cleaning while you listen to me. I want to say bravo, but you know, that's fine. Um, so I I'd like to hear from you which quadrant do you think you live in? Which quadrant do you live in? Do you live in the crisis do it now quadrant? Do you live more in the goals and planning, I'm in the flow quadrant? Do you live in the interruptions? Things feel urgent, but they're actually not really important. It's just this internal pressure. Or do you live in the distracted quadrant where you do other things instead of um, to avoid actually doing what you need to. So let me know which quadrant you live in. I'd really like to hear that from you. Um, so uh, take some time, think about it, and post in the comment where which quadrant is your favorite. Michelle, all of them. Laura, you live in quadrant one and four. Okay, so you're either living in something that's an, um, an like a crisis, or you're living in it with distractions. Finn, definitely the distracted quadrant. So the question for that we want to talk about, keep sharing, Lisa, the distraction quadrant often. Okay, great. Uh, Anna Marie, crises. Okay. Um, Laura, I feel like all of those at some point. Yes, of course, we all go to all of these quadrants a lot of the time. Repeat, please. Okay, so Gail, do you want me to repeat what the quadrants are or what the, um, where you would be? So quadrant one, do it now. You feel urgent. It feels urgent and important. 
quadrant two. It's important, but it's not urgent. It's the goals and planning, the flow quadrant. Number three, the interruption quadrant. And number four, the distractions quadrant. So let's see, um, Priscilla, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Nancy, do it now, always doing for others. Ch Chanel, crises. Zoe, I have always built in procrastination time at essay writing at uni. I became number one at solstice. <laughs> card games while getting my master's degree. It's very funny. Lynn, I live in quadrant one and four. Qua distraction quadrant one and four. Zoe, Gail, one, three, and four. So I'm not getting a lot of twos. I'm not getting a lot of in the flow. So I can only imagine the kind of stress that you all live in if you're living in quadrants one and four most of the time and occasionally three. Um, Patricia, Patricia, all of them at the moment stuck between one and three. Everything is urgent. One and three, um, uh, my um, basically one and three, um, one three four. Uh, my son delete function. I don't think I understand that. Maggie, one and three because my job is so high stress and I'm a single mom. Right. So there are a lot of externals in our lives that contribute to living in quadrants one and. Three, which is that there, particularly if you're a single mom, or um, if you're someone who ha you know, obviously has ADHD, you're going to be prone to basically leaving things to the to, to to a later time than you would desire, and then that time pressure kicks in, and all of a sudden you're in the crisis mode, and you're able to get stuff done. That's very common for a lot of people with ADHD. It's like if you leave it to the last minute, then oh my God, you only have three hours. You're going to kick into gear. You're hyper function. You're hyper focused, and you get it done. Um, I'd like to talk today about how to get into quadrant two. Because quadrant two is the place that you actually really want to live. Quadrant two is when you feel like you're in the flow. Think for a minute, those of you who are here, about when you actually feel like you're in the flow. What are some times, what are you doing when you feel like you're in the flow? It's important to, to really flesh this out so that we can understand how to create it. So please describe for me what it's like when you're in the flow. When does that feel like? Karen, car broke down, computer misbehaving. I'm in one right now watching this video, probably falls in three or four. <laughs> I'm glad you're with us, Karen. I think you need the support. Big hug to you. Um, uh, okay, so if we're leaving things to the last minute, what happens to us in our brains and our bodies is we go into fight or flight mode. And so we're relying on cortisol to supply the motivation that uh, that uh, that theoretically dopamine would do, but we are as but with ADHD brains, there's just not enough of it. So cortisol is what's the motivator, and we'll talk later in the fall because I'll be talking about motivation very soon about how the planning and prioritizing are so fundamentally related to motivation. So what happens is you, um, you're, you're, you're at the very end of your rope, you've made a knot, you're holding on, and then you're trying very hard to get to where you need to go. So you're actually living with higher blood pressure, more physiological stress, perhaps a higher proclivity for anxiety or depression. So we want to break this down by learning how to manage the tasks we have by identifying them. What I notice is a lot of people with ADHD can do a brain dump of things they have to do. I do this all the time. I make a big list. And then I have to prioritize, like, when is this due? That's the first, that's the first step. You do your brain dump, and then you start with, when is it due? because it's that time pressure that um, you, with that panic that you want to avoid. And also, if you arrange things by when they're due, it gives you some start to structure. The next thing you want to do is identify, once you've done that, which things are most important, which things have value to you. So you could have a star for urgent and a square for important, and you go back and you mark the things that way. And once you've decided what's urgent and what's important, then you can say, oh, this is due at, at tomorrow 
and it is important because it's for work and my boss really wants it by 10 a.m. That's going in the number one category. This is what I want you to try to think about when you think about your lives. So I want to go back to what does flow feel like and then please respond to what I've just said about what part of that might be challenging for you or what part of it makes sense. So Chrissy, yes, procrastination, then crisis, then stress. Right. No sense of time and then total immersion in the task. Um, then getting exhausted and jumping outside the quadrants to get totally numb, which just increases the stress of getting back in the quadrants. Okay, Patricia, if you're getting exhausted and, um, and you're getting numb, you'd be actually in quadrant four because you're stuck. You know, you're stuck in that nothing's, uh, nothing's urgent, nothing's important, I can't do anything. Uh, Rob, if flow feels effortless, like I'm immortal, flying through everything weightless, is in the flow the same as being an autopilot? That's a good question, Annalisa. I think it could be, you know, I think an autopilot, the, the, my only concern about it is what you mean by that, because for me, autopilot means like I'm not thinking about things, whereas when you're in the flow, you are thinking about things, but you're not being forced to make decisions that are, um, you know, have that pressure. So I guess maybe you are an autopilot. Mary, yes, totally. I can't concentrate and focus unless it's due soon. I have tried doing it early, but can't progress without that adrenaline. And Mary, I imagine that that's very disempowering for you. It would be very hard to know I've got to do this thing, but I can't get myself to do it because I don't have that oomph. And for some people, their medication if you take medication, you have ADHD, can help you get that oomph. But for other people, it's a lot harder. And so um, it's, it, one of the things that we want to think about is how, how do we break down tasks into, into chunks that actually mean we can do this, we can see doing this. Um, Lynn says, it's making that decision that's so difficult. Yes, John, being in the flow means not having to intentionally think through each step to, in order to accomplish the task. I love that, John, and I think that is actually so incredibly beautiful and very true. Thank you for sharing that. That's really great. Um, so um, any anybody else? Let's see what else do we have here. Um, okay, thanks, uh, Annie, for posting that. Could we become resistant to cortisol? For some things, I can't give a sigh. I meditate and exercise, so I wonder if somehow that circuit was broken or something. You know, I think sometimes for people with ADHD who've lived so much on cortisol, it's it's kind of like, well, if it's not like a huge amount, like if probably initially uh, there was a baseline and then you've gone above the baseline and now your tolerance is pretty high and that might be part of the problem. I'm confused. Just doing walking, laundry, cooking, cleaning, emergencies, repeat. I want to get back to the joy of life sometimes. Of course you do. And that's part of what you want to make time for. So that's in the that's in quadrant two. It's not urgent, but it's important. Things like healthy living choices, maintaining and nurturing your relationships with friends and family, professional or personal goals that you have, recreation or hobbies. So for me, you know, it's not urgent that I rode my bike this morning, but it's important because I know it settles me. It gets me going for the day. It bathes my brain with endorphins that help me focus better. Cassandra, like everyone else with ADHD, I'm a pro at consistently being inconsistent. Of course, I can get into a groove while, maintain, while ma we're maintaining my house. Okay. Cassandra is easy and I get it all done, but one thing will disrupt my routine and I'm thrown off or hormones will work against me. Yes. So one of the things that people with a, a lot of that a lot of people with ADHD do is they organize themselves with routines. They do this, then they do this, and they do this because that helps them understand the sequence and the and they don't have to think about it. It's like I brush my teeth, then I flo then I floss my teeth, then I wash my face. That's how I do it every night. If I wash my face first, I'm going to be all discombobulated. So I think it might be useful to write down what that sequence of things is, so that if you get disrupted, you know how to get back. 
Uh, Laura, I make an organized list, as you described, then I struggle with avoidance motivation. So I'm curious if I could see all of you and ask how many of you raise your hand, you make the list, and then you struggle with, um, with avoidance, uh, procrastination, or motivation, because none of the things on the list look good. I'm going to raise my hand for this because I'll make a list of things I have to do, and then I'll think, ugh. There's not really anything on this list I want to do. What is the least unappealing thing? And I go for that. Just so I at least start to feel like I'm in some motion. The least um, unappealing thing. Patricia, self-care and spending time with my boyfriend, family, and friends is my quadrant too. Beautiful. Uh, when I think I'm doing something important without feeling the urgency, yes. And I'm curious for those of you who are watching, let me know if you think about doing something that's important without the urgency, how does that feel in your body? I know for me, when I think about doing something without the urgency, I feel happier. I feel more relaxed and I'm actually able to attend better because I'm not stressing myself out with, oh my God, I have to do this and I better do this. Priscilla, being my own boss and listening to the list, especially when the task is unpleasant. Michelle, I can write the list and organize. I think my ASD helps with this, but then it can be overwhel uh, overwhelming. Thank you for saying that. You can write the list, you can organize them, and your ASD does help with that, I'm sure, but it becomes overwhelming. So one of the things that helps sometimes is you do a big dump of all the things, and then you uh, make a smaller list, like this morning. This is my dump for the week or for the day, but this morning what I think I'm going to be able to do, and I'm going to take two things off this list or three things and put them over here. And then I'll put the first list, turn it over, not look at it, and just look at the smaller list. Sometimes we have to do that because if we look at the big list, I don't know about you, but I start to feel hopeless, like, oh, I'm never going to get this done. Ugh. So I can get in the flow with tasks that excite me. Yes, most people with ADHD can. Why? Because, um, because of how dopamine works. So we know that dopamine is the neurotransmitter that has to do with uh, reward and satisfaction, pleasure and interest. ADHD brains um, have lower amounts of dopamine. They, and it has to do with what happens in the synapses between the neurons. Um, they either release too much or they uptake it too fast. It's just not enough. Uh, there's just not enough to help people get through that, Ugh, I don't want to do it for things they don't like. For people who don't have ADHD, they usually have enough dopamine to be able to say, I don't like doing this, but I know I need to do it, so I'm going to do it because I'll feel good at the end. For a lot of people with ADHD, you may know you feel good at the end, but you can't set aside the unpleasantness of the task right now. Women really have the short end of the stick in uh, some ways, uh, Cassandra says. I always ha say I have two good weeks a month, and then I don't expect much from myself. The other weeks, some months, my meds won't even accommodate me when estrogen is low. Cassandra, this is so true. Many years ago, I went to see Dr. Russell Barkley speak here in Western Massachusetts, and he said that women who are going through, um, who are going through perimenopause are like women with ADHD uh, because there is a drop. In the, in the hormones and you know everything is related to everything in our brain I'm not a neuroscientist so I can't say how but I think that's something to think about you know whether when your estrogen is low that's going to affect that chemical soup in your brain or if you are going through a perimenopause you may feel even more distracted or have trouble remembering things than you did beforehand hi Catherine uh, let's see Anna Marie <laughs> Your hand is raised. I'm so glad. Lynn, yes, Liz, nothing done. Lisa, hi. Uh, we can't control the emergencies in our law or, and procrastination of others in our life, and I'm not perfect either, so I just figure that each day there needs to be a space for catch-up on what really didn't get done. Um, uh, let's see. That went somewhere weird. Oh, there it is. Um, not sure if this is really planning or not. I think that actually is planning, Lisa, and it's brilliant. You know, if you set aside a half hour or whatever it is a day at the end of your day, like from 5 to my 5.30 is my time to do the most important things I never got to, and maybe it's just one thing, um, but I think that's really helpful. So you have a little bit of a, you know, an overflow area. 
It's like that when you at parking lots where there's the main parking lot and then there's the overflow. That's great. Michelle, seeing friends that understand is my best place and my anxiety reduces a bit and it can feel like I can relax and breathe. Fantastic. Paula, I was wondering if it is wise to cultivate some dissociation from ourselves. Excuse me. Um, sorry. Facebook did something. I was wondering if it is wise to cultivate some dissociation from ourselves so we can delete the I don't feel like doing it equation. <laughs> Um, I'm not really going to advocate dissociation. Um, what I think would be better is to have a statement you can say to yourself in response to that. I don't really feel like doing this, but I'm going to tear off a little chunk and I'm going to do that so at least I feel like I'm having there's some forward progress. Um, so that would be very helpful, uh, I think, to do. Um, what you're going to say to yourself is, I don't feel like doing it and I'm going to devote 15 minutes, that's all I've gotten me, and at the end of when my timer goes off, I'm going to stop. But you may decide after 15 minutes, you know, I could do maybe 15 minutes more and see what happens. Let's see. Um, Lynn, where does menopause come into dopamine? So um, I'm not uh, an expert in this, and thank you, Annie, for um, posting this article, and I know that Attitude has other uh, information about menopause, and uh, women with ADHD, women living with ADHD. Okay, so this has been a great conversation. So now let's get let's get to a different level of conversation. What? How do you decide um, what is an interruption, and how do you respond to interruptions? Because this is something that I think we could work on together now, which is things that are seem are urgent but they're not that important, okay? So, um, you know, interruptions. That would be like phone calls, that would be uh, certain texts, that would be leaving your phone on so it beeps every time you hear that someone's trying to connect with you. This will be a major distraction. Um, there'll be uh, certain kinds of obligations that feel like they're interruptions. Um, you know, I said, I told someone I would get coffee with them, but I really don't have time because now I'm in the flow. What do I do about that? How do you say no? Because if you can't say, because if, if you struggle with saying no to interruptions and distractions, if you don't have a language to use to say back to those things in your head or publicly, you're going to get trapped in quadrant three and four. Um, Lynn, always start the week off good and then by Thursday I'm totally done with being organized. That's a great thing to know about yourself. If when Thursday comes you're like, mm, I'm, my organization part of my brain is done, then maybe Friday should be your overflow day where you don't have to organize anything. Um, or you, you, maybe you plan for that on Monday and so you know what you have on Friday to do. Like maybe that's your grocery shopping day or that's some errands that you've mapped out on Monday for yourself for Friday. Augustine, I just realized I'm supposed to be studying right now. That's very funny and I'm so glad you're here. Um, Karen, it's say, I'm saying no to myself sometimes. It's saying no to myself sometimes. I used to be better at all of this. So when you say saying no to yourself, Karen, what do you mean by that? You know, is that mean being able to say no to your impulses? I think it's hard to know the difference between an impulse and, um, and that pressure because they often feel similar. Like you feel pressured to do the thing that is, you know, impulsively uh, um, attractive and appealing. Oh, I really want to do that. Um, versus saying, you know what, I, I'm going to do this thing first and then I'll earn that thing. And that's something that I think is important when we think about uh, prioritizing, putting have to's before want to's and creating your map of what you need to do like that. So maybe put something that you don't like doing and follow it with something you do like doing. Um, what do you think about that? Would that be something that some of you could try? Again, I'd like to know when you're feeling interrupt, when people are interrupting you, in particular when your children are interrupting you, when coworkers are interrupting you, when you're when you know somebody keeps trying to call you and you, you're trying to get work done, how do you respond to that? What could you say? So one thing that I think would be helpful is you know to set your timer to work for a particular amount of time 
and turn the ringer off. Turn the volume off. Now, uh, for many people who are parents, this is very, very difficult and scary because you don't know when the school is going to call. Um, you might want to give the school a particular ring. Um, so you could only respond to that ring or that tone of a text um, and the rest not listen to. Um, or you could just work for 30 minutes, have a, have a three minute or five minute break to check your phone and then go back to what you're working on. This will help you f increase your flow and reduce that sense of stop and starting that goes on so much with the interruptions and the distractions. You can set an emergency bypass for school. Thank you, Maggie. I really appreciate your saying that. Exactly. So you could set an emergency bypass for school or if your parent is in a nursing home for something like that. So you set an emergency bypass, but you turn your phone off so that you actually could experience freedom from interruptions. Cassandra, I keep my phone on silent and have set do not disturb on when I really need to focus and can ignore calls. I also tell my kids to give me time to get to a stopping point if it's not an emergency. That's very helpful. And we might want to talk with kids about what an emergency means. You know, if you can't get, if, if, if there's something wrong with um, the TV and you can't watch your show, is that an emergency? Or, you know, is an emergency more like, hmm, you know, so, um, one child comes and says, so-and-so bit me and there's blood. That's more of an emergency. Um, but of course, if you're trying to work and your kids are watching television, having the TV work not work might also be an emergency. So again, you want to think about, and I hope you'll do that here, with a little bit about how you want to respond to things that are interruptions so that you can actually block off your time to, to keep your time that you're trying to do something sacred, okay? I tweak the notifications on my phone so it does not make noise or vibrate for everything. Never accept the default notifications. Absolutely. So you want to go in and turn off a lot of those notifications as well. This is just some structural, these are some structural tips to help you create time so you can be in quadrant two, right? If you're in quadrant two, then you're, you're not facing something that's urgent, then you have the time to explore, to roam, to try different things. So I, I'd like to hear a little more about how people actually get to quadrant two when they're at work or when they're living at, when they're at home. When does quadrant two emerge from you? People said with their friends or with their family, and that's fantastic. It's good to have those moments. But what about trying to get to quadrant two at work? When you have things you have to do, how do you get there? I'd like to know what people struggle with so that I can offer some suggestions. So this is a great time. We have about 10 minutes left to start asking me some questions about you personally and what would help you. Augustine, is it more difficult for people with ADD to get back to the task at hand? I feel like I have to let my nervous system reset for 15 minutes or so before I can focus again. Well, Augustine, this is an excellent point. Uh, actually, it does take time for your nervous system to reset, and it can be anywhere from you know, 10 to 15 minutes if you've had a particularly a, a big distraction or intense distraction uh, for people um, who have ADHD. Uh, Cassandra, it took me a long time to understand that no is a complete sentence. I used to try to people please and give all the excuses if I said no, so I wouldn't be viewed as a bad person for putting myself first. Interesting. What are some of your other, what other, hey everybody else out there, you're still there. I'd love to know what are some of your struggles with saying no and how do you say no successfully? Because saying no is of course the other side of the coin to, coin to saying yes. We say no, we say yes. So we want to live, the, live our personality of yes and embracing life, but we also want to say no when we're trying to set limits and set boundaries around being able to do things without the, urgent, without the sense of urgency and the stress that goes with it. So uh, how do you say no? Gail, with my ADHD, if I don't do it now when I'm thinking of it, um, because then I forget it. 
So I hear that, Gail. A lot of people want to do things now because they're thinking about it, but then that continues to le live to, to perpetuate living in a distracted way, right? Because you're here, you're there, you're everywhere. Um, for those of you who watch Ted Lasso, it's kind of like Roy Kent. Inside joke if you watch Ted Lasso. Um, he's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Um, if you haven't watched Ted Lasso, really great. Um, so uh, the thing is that you want to keep a list of things you think about. And you can keep a voice memo on your phone. You can have a notes open where you just put stuff down. Because if you're trying to do something when you're thinking about it, that's going to create a lot of urgent and important stress. And uh, that actually isn't going to help you shift into the, the flow quadrant, which is what we really, where we really want to live. So let's see. Um, uh, Ellie, I often get stuck prioritizing because everything seems important. Any ideas, please and thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Okay, so when, you, when everything seems important, um, what, what, what you want to do is, is, is come up with that list that I was saying. You know, you write down, you do a brain dump, and you write down, everything seems important. And there are some things that have time pressures associated with them, those are urgent. So we're gonna put those probably at the top of the list. Then there are other things that matter. I would imagine that as you get through that list, each of those things that's important has some sort of time um, value associated with it. Um, you know, yes, it's really important. I'd love to know what are some of the things that you struggle with in terms of, you know, how does everything seem important? So what kinds of things all seem important to you at the same time? I'd love to do a breakdown and help you with that. Um, let's see, Maggie, I am awful at this. All right, Maggie, take a deep breath with me. It takes time and practice to prioritize. This is our, the, our very first conversation about this here in this group. We'll come back to it because it's so important. Um, and it, it, this is a learned skill and it's a learned skill that's very difficult for a lot of people with ADHD. So the first task is to identify what, what, what activities, what actions are in each quadrant for you. What is in the do it now quadrant? And of course, that can be, you know, that can change, but just to have a general sense, what is in the flow quadrant? It's, it's where you're, you're, you're really living fully. What's in the um, interruption quadrant? And what is in the distraction quadrant? If you can understand what these things are, then that will help you be able to, to, to deal with them and to start to, to prioritize when you do a brain dump. You decide what's urgent. Maybe you put a time, the time, the deadline of when it's due, and then it, it, it's importance. You could go that way. Augustine, I recruit people to work with me on important tasks at work. That's wonderful. So that's another thing to think about, Maggie. If this is something that you really struggle with, who could help you? You don't have to do this by yourself. In fact, delegating is a is a key. Um, friend, I guess, of, pro, of prioritizing. You know, if you know you're, this is something that you're not particularly good at or you can't do, you delegate it or give it to someone else. Connie, to get into the flow at work, I make a cup of tea, I close work email chat programs, put a post-it note on my monitor with the only thing I'm going to work on for that hour. Awesome. And play angry or intense music with headphones if necessary. Not sure why this works, but it does. I know why that works because you basically get yourself into the zone. You get yourself, you basically walk through the doorway of quadrant two. You've set it up for yourself so you can be in the flow. And I want to commend you on that because you've probably had to do a lot of internal work and lots of trial and error to figure that out. Bravo. I'd love to hear from other people what helps you get into the flow. Um, John, I'm demand avoidant, so saying no is my natural <laughs> impulse, even when it's not actually how I feel. So you might want to try, instead of no, to say, let me think about that. Or I'm not sure, let me think about that. And then you can buy yourself some time to reflect on whether you actually do want to say no or you, you don't.
Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, uh, yeah, it is great. Uh, I put my calendar on my phone and put everything in it. That's great. Do you use alerts and notifications? Because those are very helpful to, to, to assist you in staying on track, Gail. Um, and you might want to divide things again, like you have a list of five items, but the reality is you're probably not going to be able to do those five items. So of those five items, which one, two, or even three can you do in one day? Ellie, I have multiple... Um, I have multiple hats or roles, two jobs, home educating my child. Wow, that's a lot already. Side hustle projects that make a little money plus how or housework and budgeting. So I often get in a real muddle. You do. You need a spreadsheet, you know, with um, how you're going to manage your time. And I, and I think that can actually be a little crazy making doing all those things. Um, but I'm sure you, you chunk things like this is a homeschool period. And while you're doing this task, I myself, I'm going to do this task. And so the more that you can create that for yourself, the better it'll be and the less stress it'll be and map it out. I mean, I, I think it's really important to make visual maps uh, for those of us who get overwhelmed easily or commit to too many things, which I do. Um, Gail, yes, I even put in custom notifications. Fantastic. That's really helpful. Catherine, besides playing my favorite music, I recently discovered having an accountability buddy helps me get in the flow. Fantastic. I love it. An accountability buddy helps you get in the flow. And I'm curious... How does that accountability buddy do that? What does that buddy do to help you get in the flow? I'm waiting for a response because I really want to know what that is. Um, so being, being partnered with another person, being on a team or being responsible to others can actually help you um, stay out of the crisis quadrant, uh, be um, less distracted, and manage interruptions because you're working with others who are depending on you. And that having people depend on you can push the urgency um, level up, um, which can be helpful. You don't have to be panicky about it, but it's like, you know, I really want to do a good job because these people are depending on me. Cassandra, music helps me complete many tasks. Since I was a kid, I did everything while listening to music. Also having a body double helps. I call a friend or my mom or sister when I have to do the dishes or fold laundry. The conversation is stimulating enough to help me focus on the low dopamine tasks. That's fantastic. I love that. And that kind of speaks to um, what uh, Catherine was saying about having an accountability buddy. You have someone there to keep you company while you're doing the unpleasant task. Um, my mom used to be my exercise buddy. Bless her memory. Yes, Susan, bless her memory. Maybe it's time to find someone else to be your exercise buddy or a few someones in case it's a day where that person isn't available. So um, I want to um, remind you that, uh, um, could you, Annie, could you put up the downloadable again for people? Um, and uh, Yes, great. And then um, I, I, I'd like to put up uh, the free downloadable for you, uh, as well as um, uh, Rich Susan, you have a few. Okay, so let's put up the free downloadable for everyone on planning and prioritizing so you can use it. And that's really important. And, um, and I think, um, let's see. Thank you, Annie, for putting that up. And I'm going to look for it myself just to help you. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, Annie. And then I want to add this. So my name is Dr. Sharon Celine. Um, thank you for joining me for the Attitude Facebook Friday Facebook Lives. Uh, I really want to encourage you to follow me on Facebook to get new notifications about future Facebook Lives and other projects that I'm doing. I am starting on um, September 20, uh, on this, this Thursday, excuse me, September 16th, and that is the first group for teens ages 16 to 20. 
And the second group is for teens, uh, for, middle, for younger kids, 12 to 15, on dealing with anxiety and neurodiversity. This is a group for your kids, although you're welcome to attend with them if they have social anxiety and are concerned about it. But check it out. It's on my uh, website and, in, and on my Facebook page. Thank you for joining, and we will see you next week. Take care.